Well, it seems to have worked, doesn't it? Yeah, we don't understand. Oh, wonderful. What can you people see? A map of England? Yes. Okay. British Isles of the oh, Northwest to right. Europe. So, Mulu, it's a trivial little place and it's actually quite a long plane journey from where we live. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's actually several plane journeys. It's not possible to fly from Britain to Mulu. Uh, you have to do stopovers and all sorts. So, uh, basically, we leave the UK. Uh, maybe we'll leave the UK. Oh, no, we badly leave the UK and mm. we fly around and down to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we've got to stop over in Kuala Lumpur, sometimes we have to stop over at a different place. Uh, typically, there's three flights to get the movement. Although, if you, the first year I went, we actually flew Bristol to Amsterdam as well to make it four flights because KLM was the cheapest deal. So, Kuala Lumpur, if you don't know it, it's the capital city in Malaysia. Hmm. And it's actually surprisingly quite a small city. It's a very big area that people live in, but the city, I guess it's a bit like the city of London, is, is very compact. Um, after staying over in Kuala Lumpur or just spending a couple of hours in the airport, you change planes and you take an internal plane and you fly across to Borneo, which isn't in the peninsula Malaysia, it's actually on a big island off in, in the distance, as you can see. Uh, Borneo is made up of a um, bit of Malaysia and a bit of Indonesia and the Kingdom of Brunei, uh, which is uh, Brunei, if you can see my mousy mousy, is this little bit here. Mm. And uh, there's Miri City, and that's Mulu there. Mm. So we fly into Miri. Uh, typically, you spend the night stopping over in Miri. It's either Kuala Lumpur or Miri, one or the other. And then we will. Sorry? No. Then we'll fly on from there by a very small aeroplane. Well, it's not very small, it seats about 50 people. Maybe 30, I don't know. Um, and we fly into uh, Mulu. The only way to get in is by air or by riverboat, and the riverboat takes two days, and you to change boats and stop over in a longhouse. The aeroplane takes 20 minutes, so, and it's very cheap. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous cheap to fly. It's like 20 quid return or something. So, um, that is the National Park here, the headquarters, you can see it there, it's actually flagged up now. Um, this road here that you can see going out with T-Junction and going north, east and southwest goes from the airport to the Mulu Marriott Hotel with this side road going to a turning circle uh, in the river there and then there's a suspension pedestrian bridge into the National Park, that's the only only roads. There's no way of driving there. Uh, to get vehicles in the Mulu, they have to be taken apart and put up, or they can be carried on a bigger boat, and then they have to be taken off and cross country on forestry trails, or they have to be taken apart and reassembled. <laughs> Interestingly, the first year I went in 2012, they were tarmacking that road, and they had a floor knocks and a road roller, which is very interesting. <laughs> I have no idea how they got them there. <laughs> Yeah, and of course they built the airport, which has now got a proper time out runway and everything, so... Um, there's no mains electricity, there's no mains water. It is in the jungle, I'll be very clear about it. Um, the park has their own generator, the airport has their own generator, the Marriott has their own generator. Everybody else has their own generators or has no electricity. Water is taken from the river and treated and purified. The park has its own... Evening, everyone. Yeah. Park has its own water treatment plant. Um, never found out what they do the sewage. I hope they don't discharge it to the river. <laughs> so upstream from park, park gets all their water from the river. Upstream from the river is a Penang village, and upstream from that is nothing but jungle. 
Um, I don't think the command discharged their uh, stuff into the into the river. I think that's that's um, frowned upon. So I think the river is probably quite clean, but it's still treated, which is good because otherwise you'd get the ghost to the uh, waterways. So having ensconced ourselves in really national parks, slumming it in the jungle. We have to go out and, and look at caves and stuff, things like that. Um, I'll give you a, a quick orientation. So, if you look back, that isn't the National Park. The yellow box is around the limestone escarpment. Okay? That's about uh, 40 or 50 kilometers long you're looking at. Maybe about three, five, six K wide. Um, you can see Mount Mulu down here. This is the highest peak. It's quite high. I think it's higher than anything in the UK, but it's not on a scale of um, uh, the Alps or, or maybe it is, I don't know, but there's no snow on it. So, But it is a jungle. We're on the equator, four degrees north, I think. Um, so if you look here, this area here, this is the main massif of limestone that we concentrate on when we're here at park headquarters because uh, the other end here, that's Benarat, can't remember what that bit's called, but you've got to go and camp in the jungle and live up that end and, and I'll show you later, Camp 5 is up here, um, which is fantastic, if you're going to see the pinnacles you stay at Camp 5 for a couple of nights, uh, it's really good. And uh, just so we zoom in on the bit of limestone that the expeditions at State Park HQ are concentrating on. If you see there now, all the, the sort of that flattish looking darker green, that is just jungle, just rainforest. Uh, that's floodplain, it's all pretty flat and boggy. Uh, the, this area that looks a bit more rugged, that's all pinnacle cast. Uh, covered with massive great trees and vines and everything. It's a proper jungle and uh, it's very difficult to actually travel on that at all on the surface. It's just climbing over piles of sharp limestone. Um, if you see where my mouse is pointing now, that's Park HQ. If we come up here, it's a four kilometer walk. So that's give you a, a distance from there to there is four kilometers. There's Deer Cave. Can you see that's the entrance to Deer Cave? That is the largest cave passage in Britain. Fuck off Vietnam. That's in, sorry, in the world, sorry. Fuck off Vietnam. That's all I can say. Right? And they're fucking Hang Song Dong. Whatever. So Deer Cave actually passes right through this mountain and comes out in this area here called the Garden of Eden and then continues over this side as Green's Cave, but it's, it's all big stuff. Um, and then uh, this bit here is where Lagang's Cave is and Easter Cave and Racer Cave. That's the area that we've spent a long time in and it's really important because just here somewhere is Cave of the Winds and Cave of the Winds is part of the clear water system that runs all the way through here on multiple levels, multiple times and the distance between Cave of the Winds and Eastern Cave and Racer Cave, probably a, probably less than five meters. And hiding in this bit here is about another 20 odd kilometers of cave. So making that connection has been an objective for many years because at the moment I think the clear water system is 200, I've got a slide somewhere I think, 230 ish kilometers long and about eight longest in the world. 20 extra kilometers chucked in the air will jump it up to sixth or even fifth. So uh, that's been a big objective. Again, from Park HQ to the caves here, a couple of kilometers. Um, really beautiful benefit of staying at Park HQ is although you have to slum it there, it's not that much of a. Slum. So, see if I can get you an impression of the terrain now. Right, stop there, Google. Hmm. Uh, 
I like that nerve that he's got me. That one, right. So, you can see that there now? There's Mount Mulu, it's quite high. Just here, that's Mount Appy, that's the highest one on the limestone, is Benarat. This whole area here, coming down here, this is where Cave of the Winds and Lagan's Cave is. That's the Garden of Eden, hiding under there. There's Deer Cave, you can still see Deer Cave entrance, look, it's quite big. There's the airport runway, Park HQ, Mulu Marriott, Penan Village, absolute jungle, jungle, jungle. So, and just here, this line, if you can see down here, Malaysia, this is Brunei. You're in behind Brunei. Okay? If we don't need to go back to that, I shall close this down so that it doesn't, um, oh, so it doesn't upset my computer too much. So I'm going to have another go now. And here's my presentation. Okay. So basically I'm going to take you on a typical trip, which is an amalgamation of the four trips I've been on, right? And uh, here we go. We're not sponsored by Tiger Beer, but to be honest, we just as well have been. <laughs> you have to take your own beer in, or is that? Okay, so um, you can buy beer, right, this is quite interesting. So there are five, typically about five Malaysian ringgits to a pound sterling. If you go out for a beer in Miri, we may have had a beer or two in Miri, uh, you can buy a half litre of Draft Tiger beer for about, I don't know, five, five ringgits a pound. If you go to the supermarket in Mary and buy cans of Tiger beer, there are only 330 mils. Uh, uh, you can buy the cans probably for about two ringgits a can if you buy it in bulk. So that's 40p a can. Um, you then have to get it on the plane somehow, or you have to send it up the river on a riverboat, depending on how the plane is the normal route. Uh, so basically you're bootlegging it in. If you don't bootleg it in, you can buy it in the park. You can buy it uh, in Park HQ, you can buy it over the counter in the restaurant there. Last time we were there, it was, uh, I think, nine ringgit. You can go to a couple of the bars outside the park. The first bar, called Good Luck Bar, uh, it's seven ringgit. If you go up the road a bit, it's eight ringgit. Uh, if you go to the Mulu Marriott, it's 20 ringgit. <laughs> of course. Obviously. Yeah. So if you don't bootleg it in yourself, you can buy it bootlegged in Mulu, you'll pay about 5 ringgit a can for it then. Um, they all prefer the Heineken for some reason. I don't. Anyway, Tiger Beer, there you go. Talking of beer. <laughs> so. There's a bit of a map, just to give you a refresher of uh, where we sit. There's the South China Sea over here, you see. There's Borneo, there's Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia Peninsula, all this is Indonesia. There's Australia, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines, Vietnam, and all that. Zoom in a bit more. There's some of the limestone. Down is the Deer Cave Massif. Uh, you can see the Garden of Eden here. You can see Deer Cape there, Queen's Cape. That is the bit at the end of the Appy Massif where Lagang's is. There's Nagang's drawn on there. Not drawn on there is Racer Cave and Easter Cave. Uh, you can see how close that's Cave of the Winds. Um, I don't know when this, oh, after the 1984 expedition, none of that other stuff had been found. Look at Clearwater, there's nothing there either. There's Sarawak Chamber, Hidden Valley, Melanara Gorge, and the River Melanara. Uh, running through this gap here is the um, the Paku, the River Paku, which is a tributary to Melano, and you'll see that later. Okay, and zooming a bit more, this is after 2017. You can see uh, a 
again, look at that tiny little gap. That's, <laughs> there's Racer Cave, that's Lagang, Easter Cave still not on there. Cave of the Winds, clear water system, all of this stuff. Look at it, all of this, right the way up to the Mennonite Gorge. No entrance here. Cave ends under the gorge, no entrance. The nearest entrance is up here somewhere. It's a few hours hike from Camp 5 to get to it. On the other side of the gorge, yeah. you've got Bandera, um, cabins. That must connect eventually. It's about 70 meters below the gorge. Oh. So pe people have looked for connections. Uh, they've looked at all the caves they can find in the gorge. Uh, what we would like you to do is cross onto the gorge and in the Benarat, where there's another 50k of cave. Yeah. Wow. But I think it's probably an ask too much. So here we are, we've flown out from our various airports in the UK or Europe and we landed in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, so when you land in Kuala Lumpur and get to the airport, you have to drive, it's half an hour away to get into the city, stay in a posh hotel for three fifths to nothing. We had a day to do there. We went to see the Bass Two Caves. Obviously, the cave was on tour. We're in a big city, so we decided to go and look at some caves. So the Bass Two Caves are actually in the city. They're in a big hill in the city. I don't know if you went there, Dougie. No, didn't. Um, you get you ride a monorail to part part of the way there, yeah. and then change and get. Uh, the yeah, yeah, uh, yeah maybe Bass Two Caves. I was very young for a couple of nights, but sorry, Doug. That's most of it, but. Um, Hang on. Yeah, we didn't go to any caves in Kuala Lumpur. Just have a look. So, uh, having a look. We uh, Batu Caves. We took the train to the Batu Caves. They were a bit of an education for us. There they are. Uh, it's a bit of a Buddhisty sort of a place. Yeah. It's it's amazing, which is interesting. <laughs> What's caving like with no shoes, Les? Uh -huh. I I wear shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a load of monkeys here because there's a million tourists. Mm. As you can see, oh, it's quite yeah. tourist. I have no idea what's going on there. Um, it was a very strange place. There's all these tableaus. That's Gulliver's Travels. I've no idea why they built a model of Gulliver's Travels mm. in a cave in Malaysia at a Buddhist shrine. I have no idea. Um, oh, that's shit. I don't know why I didn't delete that. That's a massive stalagmite at the top of a load of stairs in a chamber. That's it. It's like, what? Yeah. Um, the looking down from that chamber with a stalagmite, you can see all the different tableau in the cave. It's a weird old thing. So, uh, a lot of detail, but a lot of effort. That's looking back down the other way. That's crap. I don't know why I didn't delete it. I mean, unbelievable the amount of detail and stuff, but no understanding why. These are all things. Um, it's supposed to be a Hindu temple. Yeah. Yeah. I went there when I was very young, when I was about 12 years old, back in 1979. I don't think it was elaborate then. And they've got this got book on. as well here. Yeah. They've got, they've got these, like, dog faces for some reason. Anyway. Um, somebody, somebody crossing the gang... Yeah, whatever. That looks to me like Romeo and Juliet, but maybe they didn't. There's old Gulliver. Mm. It's very strange. There's a something from Krishna. There's the steps going up to the real cave, the big one. But they don't expect much today for the donations. <laughs> <laughs> So that's gold paint. I think it's not real gold. There's a lot of steps. I did count them. And when you get to the top of the steps, you come here and then you've got some steps going back down into the cave. Cheers. <laughs> so uh, again, they can't help themselves. You know, it comes out in the big dough line, looking back down, across. All oh, that's in the cave, it's mental. Mm -hmm. Looking out across Kuala Lumpur. There we go. There's a monkey hoping to get some money. Speak, or speaking of odd things in Kuala Lumpur, you know what I saw in Kuala Lumpur? A oh. giraffe. A giraffe? A bloody giraffe. I saw, I saw his head sticking above a wall. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Unbelievable. This was really surreal. Oh, this, the yeah. Latin caves. 
I recommend it just for the experience. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that, I mean, obviously they're doing some work there, but lined up on the top with all these strange little statues. And uh, as you can see, a lot of steps. There's piles of bricks at the bottom, and the maintenance guys are carrying them up the stairs to do <laughs> building work. Mental. So, we wandered around, we got up on the, I can't remember what it's called, is it the Sky Tower? Yeah. Not, uh, they don't like you going up the um, Petronas Towers, I think they're worried about terrorism, so mm. they were the tallest building in the world at one time, but obviously not anymore. Yeah. The Sky Tower is on a hill nearby, it's pretty high as well. Um, got some big express lifts. This is from the top, looking out over Kuala Lumpur. Uh, <laughs> this is looking down to the bottom of the sky tower. It's a long way down. That looks like a sewage farm underneath it. Uh, this is... Another the monkey. Yeah, there's a monkey. <laughs> nice tat. And this is a glass bottom chamber that you have to take your shoes off to go into. I mean, okay, fair enough. <laughs> glass is very strong, luckily. And uh, that's looking down through the glass with the camera on the glass, looking straight down. <laughs> Mental. Some more shots of the Tower. We happen to be up there just as it's getting dark. Uh, because we're on the equator, um, night and day are about 12 hours long, so it gets dark at 7 o'clock every night all year round. There's very little variation in the, in the times. So uh, it's quite early, and uh, it's just starting to get dark. Just some scenes of... Uh, Kuala Lumpur. Pay attention to that building there with a camel on it. And now it's just getting dusk. You can see this was a really interesting building. And uh, nicely lit up. Look at that. Why would you have a camel on a building? Mm -hmm. So that was the tower we were up, and we were right up. <laughs> so uh, from there we flew on, flew on the very. Sorry, was that? Did it look like the tower restaurants in Liverpool? <laughs> <laughs> So Miri is the city nearest to Mulu, it's an oil town, it's quite big. Uh, so we flew into Miri, uh, there we are at KL Airport getting on our flight. It's a two hour flight from KL to Miri. Uh, we fly to Miri Airport and we go for a walk around the city. We were amused to find a street called Senior Citizen Street. As you can see, myself and Badger are, are blaming each other for it. And uh, there's a tree growing out of a house. I mean, <laughs> that's a bit surreal as well. Mm. That's just around the corner from Senior Citizen Street. Uh, obviously, we had to go into, I've um, uh, forgotten the bloody name now. It's a very popular bar with the cavers anyway in Kuala Lumpur. And there I am with my Tiger Beer, of course. We're not sponsored by Tiger Beer, just make it very clear. Okay. But we should be. So we had a daily kill in Kuala Lumpur on a couple of times and so we decided to go to Nia, which involves hiring a taxi or a minibus and it's about 70 miles away and it's the only road and it's abysmal, it runs along the coast. Uh, Nia is a big mountain with limestone propped up at the middle of a load of bog, not far from the coast, uh, with some fantastic caves in it. Uh, one of the caves is called the Painted Cave and I'll show you in a minute. So, first thing you have to do is get a boat ride across a ferry, just across the river. It's not very far, it's the only way into the National Park there. Um, crocodiles, yes, beware the crocodiles. Uh, that's a typical terrain. There's a plank walk, I'm stood on a plank walk. It's again about four kilometers from when you get off the boat to the, get to the caves. So eventually, after a long way, you arrive here. Um, this is just an undercut that the river's made. Look, you can see there's a bit of path and the steps going up, round there and on. And uh, basically, they carry on round up all the way up through and out over there. And then you look down into here. This is a, a house in the cave. <laughs> it's mental. Um, you can go in there, people don't live in there, I think it's where the bird's nest just camps. And what Neo is famous for is actually managed bird's nesting, which is still goes on seasonally. And if you look, you can see these, these are made of wood, they're big forks of timber, they're pegged together with wooden pegs. 
Uh, there's ropes going up into the roof, and they the nesters put a maypole up there, and they send a guy up to knock the nests down. So, uh, you think that's impressive? That's what goes on at the top. All those timbers are jammed in, and they can't leave it out to get to where the nests are. Insane. You know the you know the nests are actually made out of bird spit. They are. Well, they're not all made of bird spit, but the ones they want are. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Yuck. there's a whole load of, it's a delicacy in Asia. Um, again, they, all these poles, you know, they just use every hole in the rock and they jam in timbers and fix timbers to timbers and build all these fantastic constructions to get across the roofs of the caves to get to where the birds are nesting. Um, there's another nice shot looking down towards the cave house that is looking out the oh is it the cave house there it might be no there's the cave house right so over there that's a big excavation that has been going on for many years and they've been finding loads of prehistoric stuff there these caves are prehistoric and quite important so that's just mental look at that it's just never ceases to amaze me the ingenuity of man uh what's going on now is that they're actually farming the swiftlets in man-made cave buildings which are easily accessible and they encourage the swiftlets in they're all along the coast so they're sustainably farmed um which means that there's not a lot of money anymore in collecting nests in the wild because they're not they don't have enough value to make it worth people's while anymore just there I mean, I just took that shot, I took actually about 20 shots like that to get the good one, because that's just skylight shining into the cave, but it looks really nice. This is looking out the back towards the route to the painted cave. Uh, this is the path leading towards the back of the cave. And here we are in the painted cave. These cave drawings are dated from 1,000 to 2,000 years ago. And uh, you have to remember that this is on the route to Australia for the Aboriginals. So the indigenous people were nomadic and traveling through, and you see um, boats, look at the boats all there. Is that green coming out of the rock copper? Sorry? Is the green showing out of the rock copper? Uh, no, it's algae. <laughs> you have to remember that we're in a rainforest uh, on the equator. It's very, very humid and very, very wet and very hot. Typically the temperature inside the caves is around about uh, 30 degrees centigrade. Yeah, yeah you, you sort of get acclimatised to it after about four days. <laughs> it's like bath water, isn't it? Yeah. It's like when well, it's, you get in a cave, you, you know, it, that's what amazed me most. It, you might want to speak it doesn't get water. any cooler. Yeah. <laughs> The thing is, caves caves reflect the average temperature of the environment, and as it's 30 degrees all year, it's the same temperature in the caves. Yeah. So, uh, a load of shots of the cave paintings. We've lost um, the captain. Mm. Good point. Where's he gone? I have no idea. <laughs> well, we're going out. He's, 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 he's probably gone to the toilet. Yeah, right. Well, these are the pictures. You can see there's some more boats there and some strange things. People stood up. I don't know what's going on there. Stood on a crowd of boats. Not very proportionate if that's the case. Uh, as you can see, the Malaysians take their culture very seriously and have gone to a lot of expense to protect these prehistoric drawings. It's just a different cave that's open to the elements, so uh, not very far in, 50 metres if that. Um, there's a boat again, I don't know what that is there. That bloke looks like he's drowning and shouting for help. It's very strange. And these fiery things, again, I don't know what, what it's all about. But a bit Aboriginal, doesn't it? Yeah, very. And so this would have been a route that the Aboriginals took to get to Australia, so it could well be the same culture and related, you know? Mm -hmm. But I don't know when the um, when did the Abos get there, because this, let's say, this this is about 2,000 to 1,000 years ago they've been dating it. Yeah. 
don't think maybe the Aboriginals have already arrived in Australia by then, I don't know. Afraid I haven't um, um, phoned up enough to find out. You sure that wasn't just a bunch of scousers getting deported? <laughs> I was just saying, Mike, you were, I don't know if you heard me, but the Malaysians um, take massive care to protect their um, their uh, prehistoric stuff from, from people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I think that was the first attempt. I'm photographing through the bars of a, of a grill that's uh, further back. Um, they just don't seem to have moved to barbed wire. Yeah, that is a shame, isn't it? You've got a full grill at place, you might as well move to bloody barbed wire. <laughs> well, it'd be good if they took the barbed wire down. Should have put some of that in Red Allen to stop them standing on the footprints in the clay. Mm -hmm. What's this thing here? That looks like an oil yeah. stick in a triangle. It's like not even Yeah, the magic. Yeah. Who knows? Anyway, um, that's the handrail. This is a close up. You've got to be careful with handrails in the jungle. Uh, the jungle handrails become a major thoroughfare for all sorts of insects and stuff. They love them. And that's an ant that was on the handrail. I probably, well, I don't suppose I didn't want to find out if it was harmless or not. But it uh, probably isn't. I mean, it's the jungle. Everything wants to kill you, doesn't it? So just to put it into perspective, that's about three inch wide bit of timber. So that's quite the size of an ant. And there he is, look. He can't be bad, that's a probably quite friendly hand, isn't mm -hmm. he? So, having gone back to Mary, we then got to get the Mulu, we've got another flight. Uh, that, that flight is about 20 minutes, the plane doesn't even get the full altitude. Uh, I think it's about 150 miles from um, Mary to Mulu. Uh, you're flying in over the rainforest, um, this is the river that you would have done on the river boat. You can see off it goes miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and meanders. And it, so the journey in takes two days with an overnight stop. So luckily there's a, a plane now. Uh, you can see loads of sediment in the river, massively muddy. Um, what you can't see in these shots is just off the other side of the plane, it's palm oil plantations as far as you can see. The rainforest is really suffering. Uh, they just yeah. approved to cut the forest to within five five kilometres of Moon National Park itself. So it's all a quite nasty and a shame, really. Palm oil is just ubiquitous. It's in everything we do and eat nowadays because it's a cheap bulking up. Eh? Anyway, uh, just flying into the airport, we get a glance at the mountains. Um, this one here is. Uh, I think that's where Stone Horse is. Deer Cave's in round to the right. Uh, this is heading across behind. I think Happy's up to the left, and this is heading up and really losing the clouds. Uh, there's our, our plane, and that's the International Airport at Mulu National Park. Looking out from the airport, uh, you can just see that's probably Happy there. Uh, Fire Mountain Happy. API, there it is, it constantly catches light because the trees get struck by thunder, uh, lightning, and so it's called Fire Mountain. Apparently, it's a common name. And uh, these houses are like the officials that live that work in the airport and stuff live in these. And there's a few of those, there aren't very many. Uh, they were built to support the airport. There in the distance, just there, I think, that's the top of Mount Mulu. Well, how does uh, Mount Mulu first, you know? Uh, offhand, I don't know, but somebody could look it up. Uh, I've just done it. It's about, it's about uh, 2,350 metres high. So, yeah. I'll say it's not, it's not outrageously high, but I'll tell you what, it's high enough when you're on the equator at 30 degrees, bashing through a jungle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, we've hit so, it Sorry? You go up there? Not Moon, I'm I, I, Moon is I climbed to the Mount Kinabalu, which is. Yeah, Kinabalu. That's the highest mountain in Southeast Asia, isn't it? That's a good height, isn't it, Kinabalu? Yeah, it's not, it's not massively high, though, is it? You know, no, don't, it get is. Your kit, don't get your kit off, otherwise there'll be an earthquake and you'll get arrested. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, the, the important thing to take on board about Mount Lulu, it gives the region its name, but it's sandstone and there are no caves up there. So why would you go up there? <laughs> so uh, anyway. Is there any pyramids over there? Uh, we never saw any. He buried our dead in the caves in long boats. It's interesting. Well, he don't now, but they used to. So uh, it's quite common to find the remains of ceremonial burials in cave entrances. So again, another shot. Right. Here we are. We've come down the road, turn in circle, and this is where the vehicles stop. And this gateway here, uh, this is the start of the suspension bridge. Uh, you're going to see it later really important just just turning off to the left as you look well that there is our taxi that's got the best air conditioning in uh lulu it's always a joy to take a ride to the airport when anyone's coming or going just to get some air conditioning <laughs> and then of course at the cafe at uh at the airport you can have cheese too soon which is very nice as well and then you get the air conditioning on your way back so yeah just to the left here the most important building in Mulu. We'll come back to that. So across the bridge is Park Headquarters. There's the restaurant. Uh, I can't show you the front. Mulu is a World Heritage Site and they make a massive deal about it. It's really important to them. Uh, and uh, if you're a tourist, you have to come here, you have to register, yeah. and you're not allowed to do anything without a park guide. You are allowed to, you're allowed to walk to the entrance of Deer Cave. You're allowed to walk the night walk and you're allowed to walk to the waterfall. Uh, there's a loop now that brings you back round. You're allowed to walk to the entrance of Lagang's Cave and that is all you're allowed to do without a park guide. You're not allowed to leave a blank walk. You're not allowed to do anything else without a park guide. And um, that provides employment for all the people that live there because they're all park guides. <laughs> the, um, Interestingly, if you don't know the jungle and you don't know how to read the jungle and, and use your uh, parang to mark the trees and stuff, I stepped off the plank walk and I walked 20 meters into the jungle and to look at Sun Inc. And the only way I found my way back to the plank walk was I could hear the tourists talking. I mean, literally, uh, that's why they have these walls. They've got better things to do than spend every evening looking for tourists. It's a big deal there, so. Anyway, so there's the plank walk. This this is just a pond in the middle of the park. Over here is a board about rainforest, and just past that is the science centre, which is our base. Uh, this is the main mode of transport, river boats. Uh, there's all most, uh, I think they're all owner drivers. Uh, they're very expensive to charter a river boat. Will cost you thirty quid. That's like if you think about that, times that by four. Because that's the rate of exchange. That's the equivalent of £150 of our money to take a riverboat a few kilometres. Oh, million, isn't <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, the trouble is, typically it takes so long to go up and down the river, they're probably only going to get three or four trips in a day. And remember, it's 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. daylight. And then uh, they've got the maintenance, the upkeep, the fuel all that costs money or they have to actually go to Miri themselves. Well, there's a town they can go to halfway to Miri, which is where the big river boat comes to, but they still have to go and collect, they have to get all their supplies, rations, they regularly take the boat down the the, um, uh, the Melanaur and then down the Tuto to the um, uh, Long Sunny. All the villages are called Long Sunny rather because of the Long Houses, which was they all used to live in the same house. A lot of them still do. Uh, in the Penang village, the government's built them some new longhouses, but they decided they don't want to live in those, and they carry on living in their shanty town, which is awesome. So there we go. And uh, this guy here in this out-of-focus picture, that's Vino. He's our Mr. Fixer. He's awesome. He'll sort out anything, anything at all. He gets paid handsomely by the expedition. He organises porters. He organises supplies. If anything we want, Vino sorts it out. No problem, no problem. He's a really nice guy. And uh, obviously, you know, we do regularly meet up and have a beer. So this is Park HQ's um, restaurant. Uh, that's where we eat. It's all cooked for you there, breakfast and, and evening meals. And uh, 
we go all on the tab. Uh, we won't buy the beer there because it's too dear, I think. There, that is the um, classic shot of Robbie Shone's photo of um, Deer Cave. It's liked so much that it caused a massive rift in the expedition. Uh, Robbie was paid a vast sum of money by the park for the rights to use that photo. Um, which Robbie should have given to the expedition because well, there was, should have been a deal, there was nothing right and there was a big upset, a lot of people won't go to Moolah anymore over the rail that came out of that. So it's always good to think about getting that sort of shit sorted out before it happens. And now there's a memorandum of understanding you have to sign before you can go saying how um, your, uh, um, not the word now, intellectual property might be used and, and how the expedition will benefit. The thing is, Robbie couldn't take that photo without the expedition, and he had help from the expedition, and so he ought to have been contributing something back from the vast sum of money he got paid for that. Didn't Robbie do something very similar with National Ge Geographic as well? Well, he works Nat Geo, doesn't he? So I don't know. Yeah, well, he does now, but I think originally. We pulled a bit of a stunt with him years ago. Yeah, I don't, I don't know at all. I, all I know about is that Robbie uh, got a sum of money which was, I think, in the thousands, and some of it should have come to the Moolah Caves project, and it didn't. And and there was no understanding that that was the case. It was just uh, um, sort of implicit in acceptance on the expedition. So now it isn't implicit anymore. It's very explicit on how that stuff will be dealt with. Yeah. But there we go, that's a massive, it is a massive picture you can see. And uh, here we are. We get our own reserve table. Uh, I can't remember which expedition, it's in 2017. So there we all are. There's me. This guy, Rambi. Rambi is really high up in Sarawak Forestry. Forestry give us the permit so that we can do exploration. We get the only permit for exploration in Mulu. Um, and it's because of Ramby. So we look after Ramby. Uh, Ramby's been to the UK a couple of times and we've looked after Ramby. Ramby's a very good Muslim. He doesn't eat pork and he doesn't drink alcohol unless he's in Mulu. <laughs> yeah. So he'll drink alcohol in Mulu. Um, and, but wild boar isn't pork apparently, so that's okay. <laughs> Anyhow. So there's a, there's a big crew out that year. There was three expeditions in one. There was us at Park HQ, there was a Hidden Valley expedition, and then there was another, uh, a load of people camping in clear water at the far reaches as well. So uh, it was a big chunk. We weren't all staying at Park HQ, so this photo must have been taken right at the beginning or right at the end, because we never saw a lot of people for most of the time. So this is where we stay, Expedition HQ. It's Park Science Centre. We basically put the Science Centre. It's got bunker rooms and stuff. I'm not going to bore you too much with it. There it is. It's awesome. Pay very close attention to this bank walk and these steps going up and this veranda, okay? So that's what it's like inside. There's a bit of science going on. Nothing to do with us. Uh, it's got air conditioning. It's not very efficient. Uh, it's got some nice comfy chairs. Uh, it's got its own resident uh, gecko. Every building's got its own resident gecko. Um, now you see that's the main room. Uh, in here, there's some bunks. In here, there's some bunks. Behind here, there's a little kitchen, and then there's another bunk room and another bunk room. And then there's a little bridge. Oh, there's some toilets and showers, and then there's a bridge across to another building with a load more toilets and showers in it. I mean, it's, we sleep. We, we can't, I don't think we sleep that many. I think it was a bit cosy when everyone was there, but apart from that, it's very comfortable. Um, here's the expedition that's going on. I think this was probably the Hidden Valley expedition. There's um, Moose, and these are all the porters that are carrying Moose's kit in. To be fair, Moose is carrying as well, but um, these guys. Look at this guy here with his homemade rattan woven rucksack. He's just about to walk a whole day through the jungle to get where they're going carrying that. Crazy. It's obviously very tiring. That looks to me like Randy, he's obviously had a hard day. So uh, transport. The main transport principally to get anywhere in the park is walking or riverboat. Again, 
There's the departure point for the river boats. You can, you can see that, and you can see this gangplank going down to this floating pontoon. All right, pay attention to that. And then here's a river boat. This is our top boatman, Jimmy. He's owner, driver, private boat. We contract him to do all of our travel on the river. And if we want more travel, he rustles up another boat for us. In this bag here is uh, life jackets. We don't wear them. The river is not that deep anyway. The tourists have to wear them, but this isn't a tourist boat, so it's all right. So there he is, Jimmy, what a guy. And uh, here we're all getting in. Nobody's putting their life jackets on. There's Frank Tully. There's Uncle Albert look, from Any Fools and Horses. There's Andy Farron from the British Geological Survey. And our man, Jimmy, look. And off we go. So these people are going to um, uh, Cave of the Winds. And the interesting thing about Cave of the Winds is the lower entrance. So I'll just run this little shitty bit of video for you. Quality, quality way to travel. River boat is brilliant. Oh, looks like I can't handle the video very well. No oh, shit. So pay attention to that, oh, that, what you just saw there. That's quite annoying that that's not managing it. So this is how you get to Cave of the Winds. Remember, Cave of the Winds is the nearest entrance to the Clearwater system from Park Headquarters. Cool, that process is really struggling with that video, isn't it? So there's the entrance to Cave of the Winds there. There's a massive entrance above it, but the convenience is you can't get from the entrance above to the rest of the cave without climbing down into the river. So it's quite convenient that you can actually take your riverboat right into the cave. Um, wherever that's really horrible the way it's doing that. I want to buy a new laptop, I'll just refurbish this one. So remember the water's like bath water, so there's no problem with jumping out. And if you're worried about leeches, there's no leeches in the water, they all hang from the trees. Yes, they do. They don't like the water at all, so the water's really nice. There's very little in there to bother you in the water, so... It's sort of a That's the exact entrance that I went in to do the, the wind cave to clear water connection. You did that? Yeah. So you went in there? Yeah. Well, you come out of clear water then, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they told us time. Uh, if you if you went on the wind cave connection, you put it on the, you know, the state of the river, we had to do that. Like that. Uh, uh, an eight hour trip so if, if you if you have to come back uh, you know the, the alternative to swimming out is to is to come back basically so it would be a 16 hour trip then wouldn't it swimming out oh, is awesome well I didn't have to swim as it happened it got neck deep and I thought bloody hell I'm going to have to swim here and then it just sort of started to you know I was just about mm. it. I was kind of tiptoeing out mm. the there's some, you know, when you when you put down there, there's there's some very peculiar like formations in there. The rock is is like bloody knife edges, isn't it? The rock's very friable. Uh, that guano and the high humidity uh, erode it, and it's very sharp. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like a it's like a Swiss cheese, isn't it? And it sort yeah. of cuts you to bloody ribbons. <laughs> well, you need to be careful. <laughs> yeah. So the caving gear we're all wearing is a very thin, long sleeve lycra top, you know, a base layer, and a pair of Ron Hills. Yeah. You really don't want to be wearing much more. Mm. And uh, I wear wellies. They get all upset and get, they get all these ideas about the posh um, waterproof socks, what they call them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And uh, 510 Canyoneers and whatever. And I think. I've seen five ten canyoners fall apart in one trip. Yeah. Uh, in Mulu. And the socks are I guess they're all right, but they only work if if you keep all the grit and mud out. You've got to be very careful with them. 
I'll be wearing long neoprene socks, long thigh length ones, um, not my thigh length, up to your knees, and uh, Wellington boots, and, and it's been awesome. I've had no problems at all with it. It's grand, and I don't know why people want to spend the kind of money they do on stuff that's going to let you down badly, but they've got it in their heads so that this is the way to go. But try and educate them, but hey. Also educate them in the ways of canister and cream because they have this thing called Lulu foot, which is well known about, which is uh, basically athletes foot on steroids, uh, trench foot being in the high humidity all day, every day. We need a lot of care, foot care and everything, and they make a big deal about that. And I took out some canister and cream and had no problems at all, and suddenly everyone wants some. <laughs> so you can't educate people sometimes. Mm -hmm. Right. So. We discovered a couple of trips ago, this was 2017, the park uh, manager had changed and we had a guy from, who ran, uh, well it was Kango Cave Park in South America where that woman got stuck in, that big fat woman got stuck in the passage, uh, made the news. Um, he came to run Lulu Park and he brought with him this idea of these bicycles. Now if you want to go caving in the jungle, and again I apologise if this doesn't play, and this is the way to go caving, all right? Oh, yeah, that's on a bike. It's like Christ on a bike, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm glad that you saw that they got. He must have fell off that bike every day about ten times. It's quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> the, the paths and the planets are covered in algae. They're really slippery. Those big tires make a massive difference. So uh, there we are, all the boats lined up at uh, Park HQ. Uh, there's the river. Look at the river. That's quite low. <coughs> By now, the talking point within the Penan, the boatman, and the Brahman boatman will be. Oh, I hope the river doesn't get much lower and we won't get to go very far up the river. So it comes up and down like a yo-yo depending on when there's rain upstream. But uh, but it's a big deal. The river's a really important point to them. It is their only communication anywhere. So there we are in the in the local hostelry. Uh, we had this thing, um, beer can pyramids. You have to finish on the top you can't leave the pyramid unfinished. <laughs> so as you can see there, that's a five-tier beer can pyramid, if anyone wants to do the maths. Uh, you'll find that if you go up another tier, that's actually a lot of cans. <laughs> okay, that's five high, pay attention. <laughs> There's four high, that was a really slack day. <laughs> or less people drinking. Uh, there's a butterfly that's, um, you know, it's only a small one. It's obviously trying to make love to the other butterfly on the back of Badger's mm. um, T-shirt. Here's a 3D model of the whole thing. So, this is at Park HQ. Here's the Garden of Eden. The river's coming down in. It's a big doe line. There's Deer Cave entrance, Green's Cave. This is the bit where Lagans and Easter Cave and the Cave of the Winds is there. Clearwater runs all the way through there. Mount Happy, Mount Benarat. Uh, the Mananau Gorge and the Mananau River. And there's the Paku River there. They call it the Mananau Paku. The vertical scale is exaggerated, but it gives you a really good orientation. Um, the airport's there, and you can see the runway drawn on for you. Uh, I've put most of the critters together in one place. We'll flick through them quickly. Uh, that's the Watt Frog. He's not very big. But he's the loudest thing in the jungle, and we can hear him all the night, every night. And it just sounds like he's going, what? What? <laughs> so there's a, a, I think it's a python. <laughs> and that is from the veranda of the restaurant. It took up residence in the tree next to it, uh, and stayed there about five days. It must have had a good feed. These things, they are top box. Stick, they live on and under the handrails. You need to be very careful if you touch them, they excrete a uh, substance. It's not very nice. Uh, nice little stag beetle thing. There's another nasty millipede. Pretty butterflies. There's a cicada. There's loads of them. They're crazy. Mm -hmm. 
There's a praying mantis. It's, it's wearing somebody's nice green t-shirt. We put him on guard on the bear. <laughs> there he is. He's currently praying to the god of tiger bear. There's a leaf bug. That one's a good size, about two inches long. These giant mud lice are awesome. They're like little bulldozers just going through the undergrowth. You must have seen some of them, Doug. Yeah, I've got two of them, yeah. Yeah. In fact, I've got pictures of quite a few of them insects that you just... Yeah. You just show us. There's a bug. There must be some sort of swallow tail, I'm guessing, but it looks like yeah. it's lost a bit of the wing, doesn't it? <sighs> some leaf bugs or shield bugs, there they are. They're on the handrail. You remember that handrail was about three inches across? Yeah. That is a big bad boy butterfly. Look at that. There's this cave swiftlets. They live in the caves. They navigate through the caves in the pitch black by echolocation. They make an audible click mm. and they uh, do it all from memory. Their resolution with their echo sounding isn't that good. So they learn the cave and they remember. So they know we fly along. When I hear a wall coming up, I turn right. Uh, they're not geared up for finding things that weren't there yesterday. So quite okay. often they'll fly into people and then they they train themselves to wherever they hit, they stop, take stock of where they are. So it's quite common for them to crash into you and grab hold of you and then have a rest and then set off again. Mm -hmm. uh, what's amazing is they fly kilometers into the cave, much further than the bats. They give birth to their young and the young learn to find their way out of the cave. Insane. Mm. That's the in swiftest nest. You can see how that's eroded the rock. The acids from the nest and the, the waste from the swiftlets yeah. physically is eroding the rock. <laughs> There's uh, features like that in a roof called bell holes. The bats make them exactly the same. They, they grip on the roof, they wear the roof, and they fly back to the same point. They end up digging a tunnel upwards from their own body fluids, uh, soften the rock, and flying in and out where it's a rock away. Some of the bell holes are over a metre long. We measured them. There's a family of bats at the top of them. It's crazy. That is a centipede. Again, probably nasty. There's another cicada. They are ugly, aren't they? That's a um, huntsman. I've got pictures of them as well. Yeah. Ask, ask me how big the huntsmen are. Well, I've got a picture of one of them, which is almost as big as my head because I've got a picture of myself looking at it. There's a what frog. There's a cave racer. He's out of feed and he's caught up on the plank walk in Lagan's cave. He was there for four days. They climb up the walls and fasten themselves to the wall to stalagmites and stuff and hang in narrow bits in the cave with their mouth open. They don't do infrared. They just wait for something to fly into their mouth, normally a cave swiftly because the bat's resolution is much better. Mm. You can find bits of cave swiftlets where their narrows are in the cave and the racers hang out. That's about two meters long, that snake. Mm. And uh, there's an ibis, not an ibis, an uh, egret that used to work in the river. There's a fair sized snails, they're quite smart. There's a cave, uh, there's a huntsman, that's on the side of a tread on the stairs. That tread is about six inches deep. So that'll give you an idea. Uh, just in case there, <laughs> there's a huntsman next to somebody's 510 canyon is. Mm. So, and that's not the biggest ones. Mm. Uh, there's some sort of stick insect that came into our, that's in Park HQ in the Science Centre. Uh, another massive great butterfly. These little crabs live in some of the pools feeding on the guano in the caves. They're awesome. There's another one of those giant wood lice. That's how big they are, just to get an idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not small. There's a couple of stick insects fornicating. At that point, the rivers were in flood, and that's on the underneath of the handrail. I'll show you the handrail later. That's the entrance to Deer Cave. Can you see there's a stream of bats leaving? There they are. Bats, they leave in a long snake. And the reason they do that is that they try and avoid the bat hawks. I think that's probably a bat hawk there. The bat hawks way outside the cave and they'll fly through and grab a bat, but of course there's safety in numbers. So, uh, here we go again. Hang on. Is that a bat hawk there as well? So, we might, this might work. 
what the bats do is they decide to fly. They don't go out every day. They decide to fly, and they circle in the entrance to Deer Cave in a massive dome up. There's something like six million bats in Deer Cave. And they, we think there's three entrances, one at each end, maybe one up in the jungle. And they decide where they're going to fly from. And they come out in streets. But that snake of bats will just be one donut of bats. They fly in a circle for ages. Then we decide to break out and go up the cliff face. And hopefully we'll be able to see them flying in donuts now. This is from inside the entrance of Deer Cave, looking out. That's rubbish, isn't it? Here we go. So they're flying in that big circle and then they'll decide that it's worth making a break for it. And then they'll peel off and off they go. And they'll do that for an hour. Stream after stream after stream of bats goes out. If they decide to go, I think the cave empties. Six million bats is quite a lot of bats. Yeah. Uh, you, didn't let, you didn't mention that as soon as they get the first thing they do is shit. You're all broken up, Dougie. I can't hear you. You didn't mention that the first thing they do when they come out of the cave is shit. And if well, you're they, might, they might do that. I try and I try and stay away from that. Yes, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As soon as they come out, the first thing they when they circle round there, the first yeah. time they circle. Well, they do a lot of shit in the cave as well. There's massive piles of guano. There's a whole ecosystem in the yeah. cave, and it's very rank. So there's a bat, there is a bat catching flies as if it was a swallow or a swift look. That's a good sized bat. We just happen to be there at dusk and, and on a river boat and caught the bat flying, hunting. So, some, some of the caves. Lagang's cave I've mentioned. It's a massive cave system in its own right. The main passage is huge. I haven't got very many pictures of it, I'm afraid. That's a side passage called the Fast Lane. Um, you know, that's a reasonable size. Uh, there's a plank walk looking back the other way. So, on that plank walk, we identified some places that were worthy of uh, investigation, and it's going to need bolting up a big haven in the middle of the passage, which would have, you know, if you could imagine here, like the haven would be up there, mm. and we'd have to bolt across that roof to get in there. I come up with this idea and I spoke to the park manager and asked if the maintenance crew had an extension ladder and sure enough they do and they went to see extension ladder and we had to carry it there two kilometres and carry it in the cave and we put it up there, hang on that's the lie, I'll get back to that. Um, this is breaking new ground, uh, in 2012 the others had found this just open passage on the side of the main route in Lagang's cave, we went back put a bolt in walked into two kilometres of cave, walked into it, wide open. Uh, this is um, Toad Hall, it's a massive great chamber, there's a way on, there's a way on up there, the roof goes up, 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 the river's off to the right. There wasn't a river in Lagangs before we found this. Uh, so here I am, back up, up the ladder, off the plank walk. Uh, it took us a day to get bolted up there, uh, a long way up, it went up uh, another, like the ladder and then another, um, trying to think, probably another 50 metres after that. But uh, bolting across that roof would have been impossible. So after that, next expedition, we, were out, we thought it'd be a good crack the bottom ladder again, because we found another passage in the roof. Um, there it is up there. You can only see it if you stood in one particular place. No one had spotted it. We went and borrowed the ladder, and up we went. Unfortunately, in this time, uh, that all choked up with stout, and there was no way through it. But it was a good draft. Um, Obviously, if you borrow the ladder from the park, you have to clean it afterwards, and then obviously you have to get it back to the park, uh, you know, and of course, we've gone caving on bikes now, haven't we? So, <laughs> why not? <laughs> why not, indeed. And I never fell off with the ladder, which was awesome. So, this is clear water cave. This is all javelin. Sorry? They've gone javelin on a bike. Yeah. Oh, I caught a vine and nearly became a cropper, but I um, managed to stop and keep your balance. So this is clear water, this is the big cave system, this is like one of the longest cave systems in the world. That's the tourist trail that they built up in the roof. Uh, down the bottom here is the main river. Fantastic wow. bit of work. And the size. There's the river. 
look at that. I mean, there's the path there going round. It's classic notches. It never makes these notches in uh, because it brings down sediment that's impervious and puts it on the bed of the river, and then it can't erode down anymore, so it cuts sideways, makes these notches. Uh, there's a lot of science been done on on these notches and the geomorphology of the area. Uh, that's looking. I'm going to throw that slide out. Oh, that's better. That's looking from a bridge down towards the proper entrance, which is a boulder collapse. So the way you come in is from a side entrance. Um, I go to, Yeah, I I normally go out that way on a trip in clear water. You you swim across this pool here. You follow the daylight pass and watch. You come out on the entrance pool outside, and you get to swim across to the river boat. Fantastic. Um, that's looking up upstream. Look how high the roof is. It's massive. In the tourist. That's the end of the tourist trail there. It just goes on and on and on. That's the way you came out, Dougie. Yeah. yeah. And then that's looking back from the high level back to the other entrance. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of steps. And there's the other trail coming around. So it's a sort of circular route now. Again, you're not allowed in there without a park ride. You're absolutely not allowed in. Yeah. That's phytocast. Mm -hmm. You want to know what phytocast is? It's where the it's it's to do with the um of the roof of the cave involved in the it's, the sun, it's got the sunlight shining shining on the shining into the cave. Um, I, I can't forget now how it works. It's, it's like a bit of green stuff on the end of it. it is, and it's bacteria. Bacteria, yeah, bacteria. And, yeah. and they live, it's bacteria or algae, and they live on the limestone, and they eat the limestone, and they've got to stay in the light. So as they erode the limestone, they can only live where the sun hits. So all these points are bits that they haven't eaten, and they all point to where the light's coming in. So there's a skylight above here, and the sun's streaming down. Remember, we're four degrees north of the equator. I bet you could do some science and measure the angle yeah. of, the, of the um those, and that would uh, you know it will align with the sun. But yeah, yeah, it's quite interesting stuff. There's a lot of about. I've seen I've seen some yeah. in Dublin mine in Ireland. Yeah, it's not, it's not just a tropical thing. Yeah. Mm. So no, that's in Bagoost. Good luck, Cave. I haven't got any photos of the Swalwack Chamber. I'm not Robbie Shown or um. Uh, Jerry Woolbridge, it, it needs a lot of work to get a photo, so you know, I'm not carting shit in there and failing. But uh, I've got a couple of photos. There's this massive swirl pool that you have to get across to get to the Sarawak Chamber. Um, you have to rig a rope line around, that's really deep, and if you go in it, you've got to swirl around and run and come back here. You're not going to die, but it's a pain in the ass to get across, so you, you, you climb along the ledges along the side and rig a rope around there. Get in there. Did anybody fall in? Sorry? Did anybody fall in? <laughs> oh, people fall in all the time. It's, the water is really warm, so it doesn't matter. But, uh, yeah, it is Ebus, yeah. 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 So you can see it's quite sporting, and then at the end of it, you've got a big bowl of the slope, and then you're in the largest chamber in the world. In the world. Although apparently the Chinese think the Meow Room is, but they're wrong as well. <laughs> this, was the largest, this was the largest chamber in the world first. <laughs> <laughs> and actually it's quite cool, because if you put in the little, uh, as Evis does, measured by floor area, then it's still the largest chamber in the world. If you do it by volume, then the Meow Room is. <laughs> so this is Deer Cave, I've mentioned it lots. There's the entrance to Deer Cave, that's where the bats come out. This is from the Bat Observatory. Um, as you can see, there's a cave gate, they're quite canny. There's a river, the gate is in the middle of the river on the bridge. I mean, you can just wade through the river, it's not that deep, but tourists don't do that, so that keeps them out. <laughs> if you go in, there's a vantage point, you get to look back and see a silhouette of Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, got a picture of that. Yeah, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. There he is. It's everywhere, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, that's the classic shot that everyone's seen of Deer Cave, so I took that. I think I took that on my phone, actually. Mm -hmm. um, quite moody there. There it is. Much better shot. So you can see 
there's people look over here. <laughs> it's big, all right. Uh, that's the other end of deer cake going out to the Garden of Eden. That might not look very big, but to get from where I'm stood to there, you've got to cross the river. That's probably half an hour. And these trees are, are a good hundred foot tall, so they're not little small boulders. Mm -hmm. Redleaf Monkey Nesters Camp. The expedition that we saw earlier, Moose and that lot were going off to. They, well, I think they, whether they were going to Hidden Valley or not. Before you get to Hidden Valley, above Nassim Bagus, where Sarawak Cave is uh, chamber is, there's a load of caves there. One of them's called Redleaf Monkey Cave. And uh, they went to set up a camp there and found the nesters had already set up a camp. And they'd left. Uh, in the entrance of the cave, they built a camp and they'd left, but they had a, an illegal Indonesian immigrant who they paid 500 ringgit to stay there in the camp to stop rival nesters coming in. <laughs> and so when they arrived, this guy's living on his own in the jungle, and he was unsure to start with, uh, what was his name, Yus or something like that, he was unsure to start with, he had no English, they had no Indonesian, uh, they managed to introduce themselves, made friends, and uh, he became their camp cleaner and caretakers. So when they come back from caving, eat cooking food, they built them beds and everything. That is insane. So it's quite a civilized camp there. He's made them chairs to sit on. Uh, and uh, so that was, I'll just put these in because that's the view out from the camp. That's awesome, isn't it? Good I one. think this is Batu Noi. Yeah. No, Mount Mulu's up here. Yeah. Uh, this is getting into Nassim Bagus. Is a bit of video. The porters built a raft with some inner tubes and some sticks to carry all the gear, and everyone's got to swim in. After after there's been no rain for a couple of days, you can walk in. At the moment, out there, it's about 15 foot deep. So. Uh, we went down there with a makeshift ladder that, that uh, one of the porters knocked up and we bolted a, a hand line all the way along just above the watermark in case it flooded. They went in and camped in there and when they come out it had flooded. <laughs> just <laughs> while that was there. So I went to camp five one year and up to the pinnacles in the Melanar Gorge. So here that's the Penang village as we go up the river. Uh, the government built them a nice long house but they don't want to live there. Fair enough. The, uh, they also built a hospital, well, a medical centre and a school. All the kids go to school. All the kids, uh, got to think they're one generation from being hunter-gatherer nomads living in the jungle. One generation. They were forced to be settled by the government mm. uh, when the national park was created. And uh, they still go in the jungle and hunt, um, but they live in this sort of shanty town along the banks of the river. But they're all well educated, they've all bought scooters to kids, they've all got mobile phones. They're all, you know, it's like in one generation they've gone from the Stone Age to the Modern Age. Mm. It's absolutely crazy. They've now got religion, the Catholic Church has got in there, so I guess. Bastards. Yeah. So there's a group. In fact, that looks like Chris Howes and Uncle Albert and uh, Judith, doesn't it? They've obviously stopped taking some photos as we're going past. So here we are going up the Melanau River. Uh, it's quite shallow in places. We go up past uh, Cave of the Wind, we go on past Clearwater Cave, keep going up, keep going up. We get to these shoals. Uh, the boatman, that's Jimmy, uh, King Boatman. You have to get out and help push the thing up. I can see there's Chris and Judith and Uncle Albert helping them look. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> and we keep going up the river, up the river, and this is as far as you can go by riverboat. Now that's probably half an hour in the riverboat, we've probably done about seven or eight kilometres. We get off the riverboat and we climb up a tree and we set off. There you go, camp five, nine kilometres. One of the porters, the one I think that had the rattan backpack, carries a fridge to camp five when the expedition's in camp five. A fridge. Insane, nine k on his back. So that's what the path's like, nine k of that. It's all right though, because someone has very thoughtfully put kilometre marker posts up. Bastard. 
That's the reminder. It's a bit like the track that numbered the ladders in Owen Bog. So on the way there, there's a river crossing. They've built this nice little suspension bridge. Uh, that's in Camp 5. The butterflies all like that bit of sand. Don't know why they spent a lot of time in there. Um, weird. So that's the river looking down the gorge. We, we got there and we got attacked by the sweat bees and the first thing we done was stripped off to our underwear, jumped straight in the river and spent about two hours just sat in the river. Brilliant. Uh, looking up the river, that's the old suspension bridge across to the helicopter landing point, which is now over the road again. I don't think you can get a helicopter in there anymore. This is better at this side and this side over there is White Rock and Happy. There's the new suspension bridge if you look further in the distance. So that's Camp 5, as you can see, very civilised, keeps the rain off. There's some dormitories there, you've got to take your own nets. That's looking up to Appy, look at the top, pinnacles are up over here somewhere. Uh, this wasp, somehow or other, got caught by these ants on the washing line. <laughs> so we were, watching, we were watching this, they weren't taking any prisoners, look at them all. They were all running along this washing line. And they caught this thing, and they were dragging it. Oh, I've lost all the pictures. And they took it home. Weird. <laughs> uh, those ants are probably, I don't know, half an inch, three quarters of an inch long. <laughs> That's the old suspension bridge. It's no longer maintained. In fact, there's this special safety barrier here that to stop you going across. <laughs> Obviously, it didn't work, because there's Dave Goff, Uncle Albert, out there in the middle. But... <coughs> um, That's a big cave entrance up on Benarat. Zoomed right in. It's about... 30 metres up the cliff face, not sure if anyone's entered it from there or whether they found another way. There's the new suspension bridge, Tully's out all the pies look. <laughs> There's the ants still persevering, there's another shot on Camp 5. It is a fantastic place, there's nothing else there, you know, there's wild boar and there's deer in the jungle, you don't see any of that shit, all you see is the insects, loads of birds, beautiful. That's a view across all the way up to the pinnacles. All you can see is rainforest as far as you can see. Pitcher plants. I've got some better pictures of the pitcher plants. It's a bit of a for archer going up to the pinnacles. We had to set off before dawn to get to the pinnacles and back down by dusk. It's quite a long trip. You got it, Yeah, Brilliant. Really yeah. One of the best trips I've done there. Yeah. yeah. So, got to go all the way up. There are the pinnacles. That doesn't do them justice. They're probably, what? 30, 40, 50 foot yeah. high. And uh, they made a big deal about these for the tourists, but to be fair, they are quite interesting. These brown squirrels, don't know what they do when there's no tourists. As soon as you turn up, they're there begging food off you, uh, take a photo of a few of them. They're ever so cute. Somebody's feeding them noodles, look. Very, very cute. Um, some more of the pickles. You can get an idea now. There's some trees growing in the pinnacles. <laughs> They're not trivial, they're very pointy. So if you think about what you're seeing there, in the rest of the jungle on the whole of limestone, that's the terrain under the trees that you're trying to get through mm -hmm. on the surface. It's basically impossible to make any progress on the surface at all. I mean, we do, but it's hard work. Are Looking back at the pinnacles, you can see the airport in the distance. Are there gibbons in that rainforest? No. No. Oh, okay. And there are no orangutans either. The National Park's not big enough to support orangutans. Uh, there are orangutans up in um, uh, Sabah. Are there any more pinnacles? Sorry? Are there any more pinnacles anywhere else in the world? Yeah, there's some pinnacles in Matienzo, if you know where they look. They're not as big as that. There was a documentary on the television a couple of months ago, and they were, they were showing monkeys swinging across limestone pinnacles to get to the different trees and the different branches as the season was changing. Yeah. I mean that sort of terrain in the rest in all these trees here is that sort of terrain. It's not as bad as that. The pinnacles are much lower and all just blocks of jagged limestone and you just jump into one to the next. It could take you all day to make a couple hundred meters distance, you know? It's like even the locals to Nan, when they're going into the jungle, they use the caves as a shortcut to get to where they want to get, because trying to do it on the surface is very difficult. So, here's a nice Has the grain come, Cause, Again? He rolled away in 
Acid rain. Yeah, I think so, isn't it? Yeah. And the high humidity, and there's a lot of acid in the soil because of all the plant ants. Yeah. So here's a picture plant. Now, interestingly, there is a species of bat in Lulu that actually roosts inside the pitcher plant and catches the flies that the pitcher plant attracts. It's very <laughs> clever. Evolution, eh? Yeah, I read about that. It's fun benefit from they also help self pollinate the picture, don't they? Yeah, the picture plant tolerates it because it's a symbiotic relationship. Yeah. yeah. Now, the park took some picture plants and tried to plant them on the botany trail so the tourists could see them and they all died. <laughs> They're really fussy about where they live. Yeah. So, uh, that's another view all the way to and from the pinnacles. Uh, you can just make out the river there. Look, can you see a little bit of the river? Yeah. These little tattoos are just little ridges. I say little ridges of the limestone. They're still a good size. And somewhere over here where my mouse is, is um, uh, Brunei. And there's been an accord signed between Brunei and Malaysia so that the national parks meet now at the boundary. So you've got this continuous rainforest mm -hmm. uh, all the way across. But unfortunately, somewhere up here, they're going to let them log it for palm oil right up. Not, they're just going to log it and then grow palm oil plantations. That's it, and, well, and, and within 5k of the, um, there's no buffer, so it's, it is going to impact on the wildlife in the park. Mm. The park itself is protected, but there's no buffer between that and the development. Yeah. Of course, the other thing that, that palm oil will bring is roads, and that will bring in tourists, and that will have an impact as well. It will all change. I mean, who are we to deny them the modern trappings of civilization? But you mm. sort of look at what they've got now and think they don't want to go down that route, really. But I guess yeah. we have, and it's not up to us to stop them, is it? I guess. Yeah. There we go, see the airport again. And uh, there's a close up of the river. And I'll make this comment it is a rainforest. You might think that all of this is beautiful, and it is, and it's nice and sunny and warm, but it is a rainforest. So let's go back to Park HQ. Oh look, raining. That's the view from the restaurant. There's the river boat. It's teeming down. Does it look like there's a lot of water in the river now? Well, let's have a look. There's somebody heading up. Look, they're wearing a life jacket. <laughs> That's a boatman wearing a life jacket and a, and a one of the park's plastic rain max. Mm. Um, you see. Uh, we were going on a trip this day, and Jimmy, our boatman, turned up wearing a life jacket, and we couldn't the trip off on that basis. There was logs, there was trees coming down the river. It was insane. Mm. So uh, there's people out on the pontoon. Uh, the river actually came up to the restaurant. You'll see in a minute. Uh, that's water. <laughs> Those are the bank walk. Uh, that's water on the edge of the plank walk. Uh, this, I think the water's there in this shot. That's from the science centre. That's water there in that drain overflowing. There's a plank walk. Uh, there's a plank walk going up to Deer Cave past the science centre. There is the pontoon. There is the bridge to it. This was that little house where everybody waits. You have to walk uphill to get to the pontoon. There's the suspension bridge coming into park. You remember that shot I showed you right at the beginning and said note the river depth? That river is now about five meters deeper than that picture. As you can see, that's on the pontoon, looking downhill back to the, the waiting area. Uh, this path is the path that runs along by the restaurant and the river's right up to it. I've never seen it this time before. It does it all the time. That's why all the houses are built on stilts, of course. Yeah. Um, but you can see, uphill to the pontoon, there the toads, they all come out of the water, they didn't like it, they all come to help. There's a load of them there, I'll count about eight. There's the millipedes up on the plant wall, getting out of the water. Um, those two fornicating stick insects were on the underneath of one of those handrails getting out of the water. There's the plant wall leading to the science centre, there's the steps up to the science centre. <laughs> a better shot of that. Um, here's the plank walk going to Deer Cave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the handrail that those um, fornicating sticking sex were on. 
this is the Packham River. Normally that's a pleasant little river with um, rocky banks and a gravel bed. Uh, it was shaking the bridge we were stood on and it was almost up to the underside of the bridge. Uh, that's looking downstream. And here, I've alluded to it, the most important building. Mm -hmm. ah, there it is. And uh, when it floods, the water goes underneath there. Mm -hmm. There's the river. So Park HQ is the suspension bridge is just off here. This is the Good Luck Bar. <laughs> And uh, it's awesome. There's Jimmy, our boatman. He's obviously showing Chris some porn on his phone, on his mobile phone. And it's insane. This guy, his dad, lived in the Stone Age. Seriously. <laughs> it's insane. Mm -hmm. So that was a good night. One, two, three, four, five cheers. There's Badger with a tiger beer. Uh, one. I don't know what's going on there? Somebody's took a can out of me. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's getting fair. There's Rambi. Oh, there the expedition it's leader. A, Cookie. It's, That's it's a, uh, a it, Sorry? Sorry, it's only a 2D pyramid. Oh, it's, it's only 2D. It's not a 3D pyramid. No, I think it is 3D. They're triangle. They're triangle. Is it? That's fair play, play then. Yeah. It's triangular numbers when you do the math. Okay. So I think that can has been... No, that can's a straight one. I can see what's going on now. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six across the base, which makes it six high. So that's the name. That's Derek Bristol. He's a septic tank. He's from um, uh, Denver, Colorado. He came with Haysville. And he does loads of really good stuff. You might follow his videos, gear reviews and stuff. It's worth looking up on YouTube. Loads of cave and stuff, Derek Bristol. That, I use that, I don't know who that is. Well, I do, it's Cookie, but you can't tell because you can't see his ponytail. <laughs> Rambly pretending to be a good Muslim, but letting the side, letting himself down because there's his real beard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's just in case his wife sees it. Again, there's Rambly. Oh, look, is that Rambly's beer? One, two, three, four, five, six. There you go, there's Frank. And uh, one, two, three, four, five, six seems to be a number. That's uh, Mark Brown, Hugh, um, Pearson, I forgot his name. Uh, that was uh, the 20, I think that's the 20, 2017 <coughs> one, was it? Right, so we're going to leave Park HQ as is traditional on expedition. The first thing we plan before we go is a barbecue where we have wild boar that Dino's been in, and acquired. So here we are, this is called the Bamboo Cafe because it's made of bamboo. And you can see us all sat around there drinking our tiger beers. There's Rambly who's pretending to have a Coke. In fact, this is probably Rambly's photo, that's why he's not in it. There's Evis, Chris, Elaine. Uh, why am I not in the shop? Who knows? Cookie Frank. Uh, look, last mm -hmm. night, Last night. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Does somebody want to do the maths? That's in a bamboo cafe again. Somebody's made a soft drinks pyramid. It's a pretty lame look. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, as is traditional, we try and take a team photo. This year, I think this was 2012, there's Julio James, a very famous caver in Australia. Um, and that's um, uh, Dave Lucas. Uh, what happened here was Gavin was with us and we're at the park cafe and we're taking a team photo but some of the team are still at camp somewhere out in the Hidden Valley. So I come up with this master plan that Gavin would take a photo of most of us when we're all together before people like Nick and his son leave. And uh, when the others come back, We'll get the others in the shot and then they'll do a stitch. So here's most of the exhibition. Here are the others. So uh, there they were, Moose and Dino and um, uh, uh, Tony White. Colin Boothroy, not dead yet. And uh, there's the stitch. Look, I can't even see the join. <laughs> <laughs> Look, there, there, there. Brilliant. Well done, Gav. 
Uh, that's another one we decided to take, stood off the plank, walk in the jungle, we put a ladder down for us to get in there. Uh, the real cameraman's over there, I think this is Randy running around getting some shots. No, Randy's there, someone's running around getting some shots anyway. Again, most of the exhibitions, there's Vino, there's Uncle Albert, that must be 2017 I reckon. Background, I can't see where I am. I must, oh, there I am, there. No hat, cookie. Uh, this is us all waiting to leave at the airport, and we decided to do a shot at the airport. Um, nice hat, you know. Jimmy, the boatman, look. And then uh, just looking at it from another angle. That's where you get your tea, Susu. It's very nice. And uh, there's our plane waiting to take us back. There's caves in these hills as well, but we haven't bothered. They're burial caves, and we we can go, but we haven't basically. Uh, yeah, nice aeroplane. It's a uh, um, uh, what do they call them? Fokker fifty. Eh? No, it's not a Fokker fifty. No, no, it's a Canadian thing. Um, oh right, uh, they're like a real workhorse. Yeah, it'll come back to me somewhere. Mm. Uh, so we go back to Mary. Uh, this was the last expedition. We had several hours stop over in Mary. No time to do anything. So. We called up Dave Klukas, he recommended a restaurant on a beach just outside the airport in Miri, so we went, it was hell. There's Miri in the distance. I don't know how we coped. <laughs> I was looking back towards the restaurant. There were some snakes in there, that was quite interesting. Uh, I think that's Chris paddling. Uh, I'm not sure you can see any here in this shop, but there's oil rigs out there. Um, Oh, yeah. See my you see one, can you? No, yes, it's a little dot on the horizon. No, oh, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it might be, because it's there, isn't it? Possibly. Anyway, we were forced to sit around drinking beer, and we could get Tiger in the restaurant, which is outrageous. But we also have, there's Carsten Peter, he's an actual geo photographer. Uh, and, uh, there we are all just having a nice meal before we get back on the plane and fly to uh, Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. And that's the end, people. Very good.